book and CEO of Trusted Advisor Associates. The subject of today is why closing is hazardous to your sales health. And we can uh, jump to the next slide, Charlie. Coming right up. Yep. So this is, um, as I said, this is an ongoing series that we have. Um, we've had what, six webinars so far. This is the seventh in the series. We have one coming up in July, Seven Risks You Should Take to Build Trust, and another webinar in November, How to Sell to an Irrational Buyer. If you want to register for any of the upcoming webinars, go to trustedadvisor.com backslash webinars. Um, you can probably find it through the Eventbrite navigation that you get through to join this webinar too. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Charlie. A couple, a couple quick things. If you have questions throughout the webinar, there's a chat feature on the bottom. You can ask the question open to everybody, or you can ask me directly, uh, Jason Gluskin. We'll, we'll actually ask questions. We'll pause Charlie um, for relevant questions throughout the webinar, and there'll be a Q&A at the end. And take it away, Charlie. Thanks. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I uh, appreciate you coming in. This one's going to be quick. It's going to be a little bit shorter than um, uh, some of the other ones. So hang in there and feel free, as Jason said, to ask any questions along the line, but we'll still leave some time at the end. So let's talk about uh, um, selling and, and uh, closing in particular. Uh, this is a, uh, in, uh, the, the book, The Original Trusted Advisor, we're going to draw on to some extent today, but in particular, uh, we're going to focus on the second book that I wrote called Trust Based Selling, and uh, that'll be some perspective on, on the notion of closing. Closing is one of the big topics in sales. If you go and Google, you'll find stuff like this, tons and tons and tons of material on how to close a sale, best phrases, and um, you know popular sales closing techniques. You can do your own Google search. This is just a small sample. There's a lot of stuff out there. And I'm gonna suggest, just in case there's any doubt, most of it should not apply to you. You should not get sucked in to the notion of closing. Now, let me back up and, and make a few caveats, but, but first, here's a, as I go through here, watch for the yellow star, because uh, I'm gonna make a few points, keep an eye out for them. When closing actually is arguably valid, I'm gonna say there are not many times, but there are a few. Watch out for the best way to think about this whole notion of closing. What's wrong with it? What is the alternative? And what is the trick to actually selling and getting deals and sales closed without doing all the stuff that you usually read about in closing? So keep an eye out for that. I think it's useful to step back and take a little look at the history of sales and of closing. And some of you may find this book fascinating. I certainly have over the years. The Birth of a Salesman by Walter Friedman. And I'm, I'm mentioning this history because it actually does apply to how we have come to think about closing. Uh, it is, as, uh, as the author points out, much of this comes out of the US experience. Uh, we had peddling networks for, for many centuries in other countries, in Europe in particular, but the US represented an interesting confluence of circumstances. We had a stable currency. Um, even in the early years, there was a relatively stable rule of law. Uh, the U.S. always had strong private property protections, uh, reasonable availability of credit, and, and the, the ability to scale. I mean, the geographic size of the United States was unique, has been unique for several centuries. And all of those made it much more easy for the notion of sales and closing to, uh, uh, to develop and, um, uh, and, and grow. Now you can sort of divide uh, several key eras. Uh, 1800 to 1850, we had the notion of peddlers, people who you know, bought a bunch of goods and took off for the, you know, the summer or the year and, and made an annual kind of cycle. 1850 to 1900, we had the notion of drummers. And in particular, this applied to book sales and to religion. Uh, in roughly 1900 to 1920, we saw two things coming uh, uh, to bear. One is the, the notion of, of sales as a science and a lot of effort on systematizing and providing data. Uh, and also the growth of sales forces began to become apparent. And then in 1920 to 1950, uh, along with some of the scientific approach, you also got to see a lot more focus on the psychology of sales. So that's a rough look at history. Now, to put some context here, go back to 1870. At that time in the United States, there were 13 million adult workers and more than half of them worked in agriculture, basically farmers. It was a nation of farmers at that point and that was only, what, 150 years ago? 
Um, uh, so we had different terms over the years for, for salespeople, peddlers, canvassers, agents. But basically, we're talking about transactional sales. You'd run across a, a housewife, a farmer, whatever, once a year. And um, you could call that B2C. I don't remember when that term actually began to be used, but you know, looking backwards, that's what that was. That was a B2C sale, and it was very transactional. If you didn't make the sale, you didn't make the sale, you, you had to wait a year to get another shot at it. Um, in the, in the uh, late 19th century, we began to see organization of sales forces. Mark Twain, interestingly, was very successful at selling his books through organized uh, sales organizations. And he, uh, the most successful book uh, in that period was actually Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs, which was organized and sold by Mark Twain. Mark Twain went to Grant and he said, I understand you're writing your memoirs. I realize you have cancer. You're in a hurry. You need to get this done. I'm going to give you the best deal ever. And he did on uh, selling that book, which uh, uh, by the way, made, made uh, Grant's family secure. <clears throat> and uh, so Mark Twain was very big into that. The Bible also was a very big seller for these organized troops of sales. Uh, throughout this time, you, you can see even earlier on a lot of skepticism. This is an interesting book by Bates Harrington. I don't know if you can read it there, but how it is done, a thorough ventilation of the numerous schemes conducted by wandering canvassers together with the various advertising dodges for the swindling of the public. So the skepticism about scales, uh, sales rather, goes back quite a bit. There was an awful lot of, uh, of sales of lightning rods, interestingly, because if you're a farmer, one of the worst things to happen is to have lightning strike and your farm destroyed. Well, uh, the salespeople of, uh, who went around and, and sold lightning rods were very good at exploiting fear. Uh, the best time to sell was when a storm was brewing and you could walk up to a farmer and say, look at you know, everything that's at risk here. If you had bought this lightning rod from me last year, you'd be safe. Uh, they had interesting techniques like you could get the lightning rod for practically free, but in the small print it said it's going to cost you a boatload for us to connect the wire. So you see some early skepticism, some early bad uh, um, anti-consumer sales techniques, and a lot of notion around enthusiasm. The people that hired and, and managed uh, and, and taught these, these traveling salesmen were very big into the notion of enthusiasm. You have to be totally enthusiastic, and if you have that, you can win. Later on in the uh, early 20th century, we see direct sales forces, uh, professional sales forces, first in the wholesale area, like groceries. Uh, Marshall Fields, a, a name that most of you probably remember or know, became very big in this era. The pharmacy industry was, was big. Local drugstores, you know, popped up all around the country. And then later on, uh, we saw the advent of, of manufacturers' direct sales forces. Uh, National Cash Register, NCR, was a, was a leader in the development of sales forces. Also Ford and General Motors, Heinz was very big, Singer sewing machines, which actually began in Europe, uh, became very big as well. Um, during, again, early 20th century, and, and even to today, you can see two big themes going on at the same time, scientific sales and popular psychology. John Patterson, uh, the head of NCR, a total believer, he produced a 320 page manual for salesmen um, uh, one, of the, one of his early uh, executives went and founded um, uh, IBM, John Watson. And today, you know, Salesforce, there's a lot on the scientific end. On, on the popular psychology end, again, just go Google anything on sales. Half of it will be about enthusiasm. Uh, the influence of people like Dale Carnegie is hard to uh, overestimate. So those two themes going on. Now, fast forward to today. Um, as of about nine years ago, government statistics say that B2B sales are about $10, $11 trillion, which is about 42% of the GDP. So that's a B2B. Now remember, back in the farmers, that level was much more, you know, zero. It was all B2C. So as of nine years ago, we're back up to uh, uh, 42%. As of last year, uh, some different data sources here, in the e-commerce world only, now this is just e-commerce, but this, in the e-commerce era, uh, literally 90% of sales are now B2B and only 10% in, in B2C. So there's been a basic shift in the world's economy, just of course mirrored in the US, over towards B2B as opposed to B2C. 
So that brief look at history, there are some perennial issues that keep showing up. One of them is this shift uh, from B to C to B to B. That's business to consumer versus business to business, for those of you that don't know that terminology. Another perennial issue is this theme of transactions versus relationships. We see that popping up over and over. Ethics versus compliance. Do you behave ethically or must you be stopped from behaving unethically? Uh, science versus motivation, a common theme. Efficiency versus effectiveness. And, and these issues bedevil us still today. By the way, the letters on this page in yellow, I'm gonna suggest those are the common themes that, that come with us from the heritage of the 19th century. It's more focused on B2C, <clears throat> excuse me, more focused on transactions and relationships more on a view of we got to stop those guys ripping us off as opposed to let's do the right thing as salespeople. Equal balance actually on B2C and B2B in science versus motivation. And again, a heritage I think of the um, uh, B2C era is efficiency versus effectiveness. Now, why do I say these issues bedevil us today? Let's take a look at the dictionary definition of selling. Now think about it, what a dictionary is it is a, it's a reflection, hopefully accurate, of how we use language. It's an anthropological document. It's like an archeological look at what do we mean when we say something. And I'm gonna read this off at the risk of boring you. I realize you can see it too, but let me read it off just for effect here. To give up or make over to another for a consideration, to dispose of to, to, dispose of to or offer purchase for a price, to deal in, keep, or offer for sale, to make a sale or offer for sale to, to persuade or induce someone to buy something, to persuade or induce someone to buy something, to cause to be accepted or accept a price for something not a proper object for such action, to force or exact a price for, informal, to cheat, betray, or hoax, to be employed to induce others to buy as a salesman or a clerk in a store, cheat, hoax, sell up, sell down the river, sell out, hard sell, soft sell. Now, you get a feel as I go through that, it gets more and more negative the further down the list we go, right? And, and there's a reason for that. The, the first definitions are the kind of obvious, most common usage, and the latter definitions in a dictionary tend to be the more subliminal, the, more, the definitions that are lurking in the back of our mind but we don't necessarily use every day. Look at, for example, sell down the river. That came about from pre-Civil War language. That was when escaped slaves could legally be sold back into the South down the river. And that cultural heritage of extreme negativity is still present in our language. And I think it explains why we all have such uh, hanging over you know, negative, negative feelings about the notion of sales. For example, you probably all know, this would be one of your first two guests, least trusted professions, a salesman, a used car salesman in particular. Um, but whenever I ask people unprompted, the other two that pop up, no surprise, are lawyers and politicians. But used car salesmen always make it onto the list. Now, here, let me tell you something about the language in car sales. Uh, this is not true of all car salespeople, but it's, it's true of enough, and maybe some of you have heard this. You will hear talk, uh, including in the literature about the selling of cars, buyers are liars and there are no be-backs. Now, what they mean by that is that people routinely lie to car salespeople, which I would suggest is because car salespeople lie to buyers, and, and buyers famously say, I'll be back, right? And, and the car salespeople know that that's a lie. They will not be back. And it leads to a kind of vicious cycle. Many of you have been through it, buying a car. For the most part, it's an unpleasant experience. Um, and, and that comes, that's largely a B2C experience, even though it's relatively high ticket. It is transactional. Uh, let me shift gears and, and, and share with you the viewpoint of a few people who focus on B2B sales, because I think most of you here today are more focused on B2B than B2C. And even those of you that are here focused on B2B, uh, B2C, rather, I'm going to suggest to you that most of you should get rid of the idea of closing also. I'm going to quote a couple other sales uh, resources here, a couple of friends of mine, Jill Conrath, who's written quite a bit about selling. And she says in her, in her writings, the more I wanted to close a sale, the less likely I was to get it. Now she used to sell for IBM, totally well-respected organization. This is one of her conclusions. Here's another one. I would never recommend that anyone try closing on a corporate client. Always be closing? No, the only cure is to detach from the outcome. 
Now, I happen to totally agree with Jill. Let me mention another one, Andy Paul, another good friend, a, a, maybe the best read guy in all the sales literature that I know of. Um, and he suggests closing is not the last step in a process, which is how it's usually portrayed. It's simply the point where the process ends. People spend way too much time on the front end of sales, lead generation, and on the back end, closing. But the real closure happens in the middle, during the discovery and relationship building. I think Andy's absolutely right about that, and I'll, I'll dig a bit more into that as well. So why do I have this negative opinion about closing? Well, let's go through that. The case against it, it's transactional. It misrepresents the way that we actually make decisions. It's focused on efficiency rather than effectiveness. It's all about you, the salesperson, as opposed to about the customer. Hello to somebody's dog barking there. <laughs> it alienates future customers and it encourages short-term thinking and finally it just doesn't work. So let me speak to a couple of those points. Most of you have seen a model of a sales process and they all look something like this. They begin at the left and they go to the right, they're linear, and they end up with something called closing. And sometimes there's a yellow line that says rinse and repeat, go back to the beginning but it's basically transactional, which means the whole focus is on how do I get to the end? It, as I said, it's linear with an option to rinse and repeat. It's short-term goal-oriented. It assumes that people make deductive logic decisions, and I would argue they don't. It's not like that at all. The alternative is probably something more circular, what I would call a relationship model, and most of these kind of go around a cycle, not necessarily in this order, but largely, and every once in a while, a sale pops out. Now I'd suggest to you that's a lot better model for thinking, especially about B2B sales, when you're gonna be related to people over a period of time, and one sale is not the end of the, of the relationship. So uh, there's that. Now, focus. Sorry, I'm gonna pause you for one sec. Uh, yeah. If anybody has questions, just for people that, some people join late, there's a, there's a chat feature, you can ask questions, but if you have questions, feel free to enter them now, and yeah, or we can answer them as they, there's none yet, but I just wanted to, people know. Great. Go ahead. Thanks, Jason. Um, those of you that have been in, in this trust series have heard about the trust equation. The denominator, you recall, is self-orientation, which has to do with where your focus is and your motives and your attention and whether you're focused on the other person or neurotically obsessed with yourself. Well, the notion of closing fits right into this because our focus is frankly on manipulating and controlling the other person and getting them to do what we want them to do, which is sign on the bottom line in our time frame. And I would argue that there's a misguided belief that we can control other people's minds. We are not that good at controlling other people's minds. All of us on the buyer side know pretty well when we're being manipulated and when somebody's using us as a means to their own ends. Uh, there's an efficiency trap that's kind of built into the history of, of uh, transactional B2C sales also. And we see this today. CRM systems are largely oriented towards efficiency. The, the message that they send is, you know, minimize the amount of time that you spend on dry leads. Make sure you qualify, get them out so you're not wasting a lot of time drilling dry holes and so forth. Well, that makes lead qualification a goal. And, and frankly, it, it turns off all the people that get qualified out. Uh, I don't know how your experience is, but I know I get five or six or seven inquiries a day. Somebody you know, wants to link up to me on LinkedIn and the first thing they do is send you a sales pitch. And I always look at that person and say, uh-uh, we're not, you and I are not talking anymore. That's just a, a violation of how I like to relate to other people. So if, if you, whatever sales process you have, let me make a small suggestion. If you begin conversations with someone and it turns out after a while that they're really, you're really not right for them, it's not a right fit, don't flush them away immediately. Spend an extra five or 10 minutes with them exploring what it is that they really do want and how, you know, whatever thoughts you might have that would be able to help them. They will remember that conversation. And you can think of that as an investment in marketing time as opposed to sales time. It's a good investment. You're already, you'd be talking to somebody who was a reasonable qualified lead at some point it's a good way to spend some marketing time. Um, the, the notion of closing also focuses on short-term performance. Whenever you see people focusing on closing, it's to get to a goal quickly. And I thought it's worthwhile to mention a conversation I had not too long ago with an investment banker. I was giving a session on trust and he came to me and he said, listen, Charlie, before we get started, let me be clear. I really like money and I have no need to apologize for that. 
I maximize my monthly incentives, and if this firm ever changes its incentives to weekly, I'll be right there too. Now, the truth is, um, he, what he's saying is, I'm gonna behave in the short-term way to maximize my short-term benefit. Here's where he's wrong. Think about that logic as applied to strategy. What if we changed our strategy, our corporate strategy every month? It would be a disaster, right? Well, I would argue that people relationships are the same thing. If you change your behavior with other people every month, every week to suit your needs, they're gonna pick up on that very quickly. The fact is behaving in a long-term manner produces better short-term results than behaving in a short-term manner. So the best short-term performance actually comes about from acting on long-term client interests. What does that have to do with closing? What it has to do with closing is by you forcing a time frame on other people, you're basically saying, I'm operating in my short term and I will use you in whatever way I can to maximize my short term interest. Well, paradoxically, that doesn't work. We can all see that coming and we tend not to behave as well as we do with people who treat us in the long term relationship manner. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even work. Neil Rackham, in his famous book, Spin Selling, and Neil is still kind of the, the godfather of, of sales research and so on, very well respected. And he actually did some research in that book. He found out that for small transactions, if you send people to closing uh, uh, school, you know, to train people in closing techniques, you do see a 4% improvement in their ability to close for small transactions. For bigger transactions, if you send them to closing school, they actually get worse at closing, a 9% decline. So think about that. The more you train on closing techniques, the worse you do. That's Neil Rackham with a lot of data. And by the way, what's the difference between small and large? In his study, $109. That's a pretty low hurdle for a lot of you on this phone call. And that was a few years ago, maybe inflation, maybe it's $250 now. It's not a big number. So if you believe in data, if you believe in Neil Rackham, here's evidence that training people in closing techniques is actually dysfunctional. I would argue in, uh, from the trust work that I've done, many of you have heard me say this, the number one cause of trust breakdown is accelerating way too rapidly to the answer. Closing is a great example of accelerating way too rapidly to the answer. If the person hasn't bought and you try and close them, you know, what's that? What's that except accelerating rapidly to your conclusion? And it tends not to work, and it certainly destroys trust. So what's the solution? Well, let me put it in a storyline here. How many of you, when you were 19 or 22, when you're thinking about what you wanted to be when you grew up, you decided, I know, I want to be a salesperson? My guess is zero of the people on this call. We don't like the S word. We, that's why we use phrases like business development. Um, selling kind of a four letter word still because of our cultural history. Most of us want to say, that's not me. I want to stand for professionalism, client service, excellence, integrity, all those great things. So we don't want to get better at selling. That's just out of one, you know, fish pond to another. Uh, we want to be professional. So how do we square that circle? How do we become, you know, effective at selling and yet professional, ethical, and so forth? And the answer I'd suggest is what I call trust-based selling, or if you prefer, trust-based business development. Uh, and it starts right at the goal level. The goal of traditional sales, that linear deductive process is to get the sale. Pick up any book on sales and that's what they'll try and get you better at, getting the sale. That's where it goes wrong, right at the beginning, because the goal of trust-based business development is not to get the sale, it is to help the client. That's a profoundly different goal. And from that perspective, by the way, helping the client, that means that the sale is simply a byproduct. It's not the goal. Now, think about it this way. If you met somebody in a sales context and you were the customer and you found somebody who has your best interests at heart and who actually is seeking to understand your interests, not to try and sell you, but to understand your interests, who is able to offer advice that is useful to you, who is not trying to get you to buy, that's not what they're about, someone who is driven by your calendar and not theirs. In other words, there's nothing on, uh, you know, they're not operating off, I've got to close these people by the end of the quarter. Who is not wedded to this transaction. They're not here to make this deal happen. And they're completely transparent and honest. Well, why would you not buy from these people? It is natural to buy from them. These are the people you want to buy from. 
your best interests at heart, honest, understanding your interests, no time pressure, not what is the transaction, guess what? There's a paradox at heart here. And that is if you detach from the win as your objective, you're actually gonna get more sales. Now I call that a paradox because I think in common language, it, it kind of is, you know, if you detach from the outcome, which is exactly what Jill Conrad said, if you remember on that slide, stop trying to get the sale, you will get more sales. And of course, you've got to be careful. You have to be genuine, honest, and true about that because all of us as people can sniff out hypocrisy very easily. You actually have to commit to giving up that as a goal. Now, this is a matter of mindsets as well as skill sets, just to point out a few of them. Selling is not the goal. The goal is to help the client. Uh, let's be clear about where the chicken and where the egg is here. Um, the, the chicken is helping the client. And you could say the egg then is, uh, is the sale. The truth is the sale is a byproduct. It's not a goal. That's the right mindset. Mindset number two, the point is not to win. Uh, any of you have been involved in sales organizations or sales literature, um, there's an awful lot of celebration of win-win, rah, 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 athletic metaphors, success, all that stuff. But the point is not to win. There's only win-win when you think about a trust-based approach to selling. That's the only way there is. And finally, don't think about a deal. Think about instead relationships. Relationships that, that are nurtured uh, provide uh, uh, deals like fruit you know, coming off a tree. But if all you're focused on is the fruit and the deal, you're gonna ruin the relationship before too long. There's a few key skill sets like don't handle objections because objections frankly are engagement. Don't think of them as combative and how to counter them. Think of that as an invitation to keep, uh, keep engaged. Uh, the, real, the real problem is not objections, it's disengagement. Another big skill set, don't listen just for data. Don't listen just to prove a hypothesis. Listen instead so that the other person feels heard. There's a natural human reaction. If they feel heard, they're gonna respond then by becoming interested in what you have to say, but not until they feel you've listened to them. So uh, this notion of always be closing, many of you may have uh, seen the movie, um, oh shoot, what am I, I'm forgetting the name. Glengarry Glen, Glen Ross made this phrase uh, famous. They also used to use it at IBM and Xerox. So it's just not right for most of us, however. Instead of always be closing, always be curious. If you focus always on curiosity, understanding your clients, helping explore that middle ground of joint discovery, collaboration, things will work better for you. So how do you do this? Well, I'm gonna be a little abstract, but it's basically do the next right thing based on four principles. Client focus for the sake of the client, not for you, not for your bottom line, but, but completely for the client. Number two, a habit of collaboration. You're always on the same side of the table, if you ever find yourself mentally distancing yourself on the opposite side of the table, rethink, stop, reset, get back on the same side of the table. You are on the same team as your customer. Number three, a default to transparency, except where you're illegal or hurtful. Why should you not share everything with other than those two exceptions? Be open, be direct, assume it's all gonna get printed on the front page of the New York Times anyway, don't be afraid of it. And the fourth principle, which we've touched on a lot, Focus on long-term relationships, not on short-term transactions. If I had to sum it all up in one way, I'd do it this, the brother-in-law test. Sell as if you were having a conversation with your brother-in-law after dinner at the family holiday, Thanksgiving if you're in the US, and you're watching the football game and your brother-in-law says, hey, you guys know something about this. How should I think about this? Or how can I buy this? And uh, you would respond, I'm sure, all of you, would respond by saying, well, you know, let me tell you what I can think and you probably should think about this and you should probably do that. And if your brother-in-law says, wow, can we buy from you guys? You probably say, well, maybe, I mean, let's, let's think about that. <clears throat> I'm not trying to pitch you, but let's explore it. Maybe you should. It's that kind of directness, that kind of connection, that kind of intimacy and that kind of honesty that I suggest you bring to sales. Closing is not part of that. Closing, as Andy Paul said at the beginning, is simply the point at which the process is finished. It's not a part of the process. Now, let me stop there. And uh, Jason, I think you're gonna pop in a poll for us, to, uh, for people to give us some quick feedback here. There we go. We need a quick poll. Uh, if everybody can take a moment just to let us know what they thought of this webinar. We already have a question, uh, which is the next, the next part of the, the, uh, the webinar. It's from Gail. She says, um, can you please address best practices for a trust-based approach to expanding business within an existing account? 
Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see how to sum that up. Uh, I lead with curiosity and offer some, uh, what I call bring a risky gift. Uh, so again, exploring within, within an existing account, um, we need to get rid of the mentality that our job is to finish the project and get out while you're there doing whatever you're doing in that existing account, make sure you take some time to kind of, you know, pop your head over the, uh, the wall, if you will, and look around and see where are there opportunities in that organization and do just a little bit of thought and a little bit of research and humbly approach maybe your existing client and say, listen, I, I couldn't help but notice these things going on over here. Now, I could be wrong, but it strikes me that maybe this is missing or maybe they could use a little bit of that or maybe this thing is going on. Have I got that right? Would you mind chatting about that with me? Because, you know, maybe we can be some help in that area. In other words, you demonstrate that you've thought about it. You are willing to take a little bit of risk by putting out a hypothesis. You're humble about it by acknowledging you're not an expert in this area, but you're raising the question and you should raise that question. Because if you're a professional uh, person involved in a client organization, you should be aware of and awake to opportunities to help make that business better. And not all of them are gonna be on the project in front of you. So it's very ethical, I think, to, to look and find those opportunities. And again, you, you express them by taking a little bit of risk on your hypothesis, humility, and offering up uh, an opportunity to engage. All right, so we got some other ones rolling in here. Um, Doug asks, what's the best way to make sure the economics are fairly addressed? He, I think he's, and he, he just, and I wanted to clarify, I was wondering if he meant his own time or the salesperson's time. He said, partic yeah, yes, particularly when you're providing your value as expertise, wisdom, counsel, and advice, uh, no margin of product to compensate. Uh, so if I understood that right, you're saying, how do you make sure you don't waste huge amounts of time and give away huge amounts of advice and not get paid for it? Is that right? Yep, that, that's, the, that's the question. Yeah. I, cut it off, well, yeah, I, I, I think the key to that one is it's not a short-term question. You don't ask that question every week and you don't ask that question every conversation. You ask it every, I don't know, it depends on the business, every month or so. Uh, so in the short term, give away information, give away insights, give away advice. There's no shortage of problems. And, and the idea of sample selling, giving somebody a, an example of what it feels like to work with you, that's a good thing. Now, every once in a while, let's say every month, you need to step back and say, hmm, how's it going with this account? Or do we see any prospect of return on this one? And there may come a point where you say, you know what, we've been giving away a lot, not getting anything. I don't think this is gonna work for us. Let's, let's part ways, friends, and so forth. But the point is you don't do that at a micro level. You don't do that with every conversation. You don't check your probabilities of win and screen them out every week or so. Uh, the, the, we, we err too much on the short term. Make that a longer term strategic conversation to have. So the next question is, so it's, I'm gonna kind of reframe this. I'll read the question and then I think I understand how it's, uh, where we're going, but how do you handle a large customer contracted with you to sell? So like a reseller basically, who does not buy into the, the trusted, the trust-based approach. They cannot be fully trusted in the relationship. Uh, they take your price terms and other benefits and shop you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the quick answer, the two parts, not, number one, make sure you're not really underestimating their ability to trust. In, in my experience, if you give, most people a chance, 80% of them roughly will behave, you know, they'll live up to your expectations. They'll respond positively. But there are some, I don't know, 10%, 20%. At that point, you have to make a decision. It's generally not profitable to work with people who are untrustworthy. They'll, they'll fight you on margins. They'll give stuff away. You're better off having customers like that go with your competitor. Make it your competitor's problem. Just opt out of them. But I go back to the first one. Don't be too quick to pull that trigger. You know, sometimes we approach people with suspicion. And when you do approach someone with suspicion, they're going to live down to your expectations, just like they live up to your expectations. So, you know, don't, don't be too quick to rule people out as, as untrustworthy. But when, you, when they really are there, give them to your competitor. So we have a comment that I'm going to, uh, I'd like to take on. Somebody wrote in and said, uh, if you if you if your product and service can be sold on Amazon, you don't need a salesperson. Uh, 
but but you know i would argue that every business you're selling to somebody right you're selling to your support your you know if you're, if you're working with uh suppliers or distributors it doesn't really it doesn't really matter uh, uh it's but let, let me let me take the question in the in the very specific sense it was it was asked i think that's true we're increasingly getting to the point where the actual transactions you know, do take place uh, without any interpersonal contact. And yeah, there's still some context behind, but you know, whoever asked that, you're right. You don't need the trust stuff as much if you're gonna click on Amazon. However, um, for, the, for, the, for the rest of us, and even for whoever has that product, in your entire ecosystem of selling, there are still probably some points of personal contact. And because they're less of them these days, that doesn't mean they're less important, it means they're more important. If you have, you know, we're still human beings. We still operate as psychological, you know, protoplasm entities, and we still react very strongly. There are certain purchases and buys where we want to have that personal contact. And uh, for those products and services, which are still the, the majority of large ticket uh, purchases, uh, the importance of those slightly declining interpersonal interactions actually increases. So, yeah, there's some things we used to buy in person that we don't have to anymore. I don't miss going into the bank tower to get a hundred dollars out of my account. And increasingly you're going to see with Carvana coming on, we're, we're pushing, you know, can you buy cars without ever having talked to somebody? Well, yeah, you can. I don't think that that's um, uh, necessarily um, a disproof of the importance of trust. It just means if we can make all the systems right, so we don't have to depend on some personal people in situations, why not? I agree. There's still plenty of room, however, for personal trust on most of the products that we're talking about. Even if it's a chat box, that can be very important and very personal in a direct right. kind of way. Tracy actually had to get, Tracy's on the, the trusted advisor team. She had a good comment that there's still customer service. And that's, you know, that's, that's a great point. Right. Right. And it, we all have to deal with that. Uh, yeah, that's the last button. question. If anybody, is, is any, if anybody else is on and has any more questions, otherwise we can end a few minutes early. Um, Charlie, you want to go to the next slide real quick? Yes, sir. So thanks everybody who attended. If you have any questions, um, you can email Charlie directly at cgreenandtrustedadvisor.com. And um, uh, obviously our website's got a plethora of, of additional information. We're going to be sending out a follow-up email with some links to content and articles. We also have a podcast that we publish every, about every two weeks if you want to uh, subscribe to that. Um, and we are doing these webin webinars every quarter. So go to trustedadvisor.com backslash webinars. Charlie, you want to close off with anything? Just want to thank everybody for their time today and uh, go forth and be great trust-based sellers. Have a great Thanks day. A lot of Take care.